Great. Welcome right. to Augur. Uh, just put the meeting notes into the, the chat <coughs> for the Zoom call. And we kind of laid out some, some agenda items that are candidates anyway, including risk work, um, up, updates to documentation, which are significant, um, the introduction of the appeal command, and we have a question. I think we also want to show this we improved, we fixed some of the glitches with the front end with the graphs. So let me start with, um, or do you want to drive Gabe or Carter? Um, if we start with risk work, you should probably drive. Right, but yeah. I can talk about documentation. So. Well, let's start with the risk stuff. Oh, are you sharing your screen? Oh, let me, let me share my screen, which will make starting with the risk stuff all that more useful. There we go. All right, so um, these are the repos for the Zephyr RTOS. And this is the basic page, um, which now has commits for all the years that a repository has commits in. And we have the pull request issues, new issues per week, all those things are there as they were before. One of the UI glitches that we fixed, fixed since last time is um, our comparisons now work again that had been momentarily disabled. So that takes a little bit to run. I did fix it, then, so. But I wanted to put on a good old demo. There you go. Obviously we're working on the front end performance for this. Yeah. Um, this is, it does comparisons for all of the graphs, right? Right. Yeah. Probably why it's taking so long. So it's calling each, it's calling a bunch of endpoints uh, six times for each of the there we go. things. Yeah, yeah. So you can see commits per week. Uh, this is the Garrett archive code changes. You can see Zephyr is the darkest one, kind of a long base here. You can probably stretch these out so the zeros look a little better. Mm -hmm. And then not all the issue, not all of the repositories in the Zephyr group actually use GitHub issues, so you have a very small thing. But the thing, the thing that's fixed on all these graphs is now the graph doesn't run off these pages, um, and you can see there. And something we're planning to add in the near future is uh, bringing back some of our old options for these kinds of charts. And one that would be particularly useful with this comparison is uh, using a z-score rather than the um, raw, yeah, absolute values of the metrics. And then, so like with Zephyr, which is like a bigger repository, you'd be able to see like more relative changes rather than just one bigger repository kind of throwing off the whole chart. And we also are in the process of adding, re-adding begin and end date uh, functionality. So for users who like to, you know, look at metrics by release or by year or month, things like that, we want to be able to support that also. Mm -hmm. It is worth noting that um, that functionality exists in the back end in the API as it's documented in the API docs. Um, we just got to port it to the front end. So, so it's just a visualization update. So on, on this, Sean, when you were doing the compare. Yeah. Um, can you, so you had the Zephyr real time operating system. Right. That was the left directory, right? And so then it takes all of the repos out of there. Is that right? Uh, well, what I did was I selected a repo group yep. for comparison. So it seems reasonable I would compare projects within that ecosystem. And then I selected additional repos to- so You selected a couple. Yeah, I selected like five additional repos. So a total of six. Okay. <laughs> so it'll take whatever repo you're on and add to it. Okay, so could I compare in this, could I compare Zephyr to Rails? I don't sure. know why I would do that, but. Sure, you can do that. So now I have Rails. 
So that top search bar is just like, go ahead and grab any repo. I may have to hit reset on that. It looks like um, once you've done a compare, you have to hit reset. Okay. Um, so we should either take away the ability to make selections yeah. or force a reset or something. Or just when they hit apply, do it. Yeah. So here you can see it went a lot faster because I only selected one repository to do a yep. comparison. Um, and you can see, you know, with absolute numbers comparatively, there are more lines currently changing in Zephyr than there are in Rails, which makes sense because Zephyr is a rather quickly growing project. And so Rails it looks like a rather stable one. So when you did the compare from your repos, like right now on this page, I'm inside of Zephyr. Yeah, I Zephyr is so home, and you have, I've chosen Rails Rails as the comparison. So click reset. So when I do a comparison here, I can compare within this, or I can compare across, it looks like. Yes, you can compare essentially any repository that is in the version of Augur that could be the, the but set I can of data compare, that in Augur. But I could compare repos within Zephyr. Yes. Or, you or can I could compare across one repo in Zephyr against one repo in Rails. Yeah. Um, I think I can compare multiple repos across. Yeah, so you could pick like some from Rails, some from Contest, some from Zephyr. So if I wanted to compare just Zephyr, I would, while I'm in Zephyr, I would pick Zephyr. And then I would so, pick. So when you're, I guess one of the, I guess the thing that you're asking that's implied but not directly stated is when you're in a, all of the comparisons are going to pivot off of the repository that you're in. This so page right here. Yes, so you're, the assumption is whatever else you select, you're going to see Zephyr. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, you can, you can compare. So if I just wanted to compare like Rails repos, I would have to leave this. Like, like only I'm Rails repos? Gonna, yeah. Just only Rails repos with each other. I would have to leave here. Yes. Go to groups, go to Rails and then do some comparison in there. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. All right. And then, so any more questions or thoughts on this? Mm -hmm. So the, the other thing we have to show you is Matt Snell got the licensing information fixed for risk. So you have four counts by week, committers by week. We had this before, but now under licenses declared, you can see that each of the licenses, this is the number of files that each license is present in. So previously we only enumerated the licenses that are in a particular repository. Now with this information, one can easily see that almost all of the licenses, almost all the files in Zephyr are licensed with Apache 2.0. And there's a small assortment of other files with different licenses, um, the most common of which being BSD3 and MIT. And the rest of them look like rounding errors. Mm -hmm. So what happens if you click any of those? So the ones that have, I, I don't know if Matt has gotten the SPDX identifier or the, this doesn't look like the SPDX. So this oh, is open, but it's OSI. Right, so you still got the OSI one definitions and not the SPDX ones because I, I assume he's working on the SPDX ones. Okay. And so that would be, and I also think that SPDX has some of these licenses without a highlight yeah. identified. So you would get more, more links. Right. Okay. And the downloading of the SBOM is going to be more advanced, but I don't think he's generated it for this database yet. No, it yeah. So I talked to him about that yesterday and um, he said he can produce a full SPDX at the moment. And so we had talked about instead of just calling it software bill of materials, because that seems like kind of a word that has a lot of people who have a lot of opinions about it. Right. Maybe just call it SPDX and just say download the SPDX document. I think that's the good choice that's more clear to people and it avoids some of the diverse understandings of what a software bill of materials yeah. 
Right. And then we stay out of it. And we are actually just following a standard, which is SPDX at that point. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, another thing. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, what else should I show them? Yeah. Um, I think those are Yeah. Yeah. There were a couple small, um, like, there was a one chart that just had a weird axis being cut off. We uh, fixed that. Um, there's some, I think there's some other. That was here under, so all the insight charts, mm -hmm. you might remember this kind of extended above the page. I do, yeah. For all these, and so all that is fixed right now. Okay. Which is nice. The one thing I thought was fixed, but isn't yet, um, I thought it was fixed because that's what I asked to be fixed, but I think it was a separate task that isn't complete yet, is this particular, so the see more is still, I'm not sure what's happening with it. Okay. Right now, but all of the different smaller charts have, they're not running off the page anymore. So what happens on, if you go down to view, just scroll down a little bit, what happens if you click view full report? Uh, it looks like nothing. Something's supposed to happen? It's supposed to uh, bring this one up to here. Oh, oh it, did. it did. It actually, okay, it did. It brought, <laughs> It brings it brings the bad it brings the non-working chart sure. up to the top. So well, it doesn't that's work. Not clear. <laughs> so it'll okay. it'll be more clear that that will clear that will obviously change. So can you click on insights again? Just over on the left. So okay, so view what happens if you click view insight details? That's the page that we were just on. So if I, I see. Uh, if I click this one. It's a different one than I clicked before. It'll show us an empty chart at the top for okay. Cordova. And it's not finishing. Uh, click on contributors to vault you full report. Yeah, um, it's changing that. I feel like you tell me if this doesn't make sense, but I feel like if I'm on Cordova and I click on contributors, I feel like those should like the contributors one should then then be replaced with something else. Probably just switch it to Cordova. Yeah. So that if you don't have the smaller graph and then the larger graph. That would make more sense to me, or just like maybe another top insight. Um, maybe but make that note. Yeah. For this. So go back. So go back, Sean. So if I'm looking at this, and if I'm looking, just I'll pick that top corner left one. Mm -hmm. And so this is for Rails sprockets. So if I click on View Insight Details. That's right. So the non-functioning graph. Yep. And then I have things below. These are other top insights on this in, in Tobogger that are showing up right now. Which is basically anything that I have in the groups, any repo that I have in any group. Right. Okay. And then you have repo groups with their, each of the five most notable cases in a repo group. Okay. All repo groups in an instance. So what, um, so the picture that's not showing up, yeah. how is that supposed to be different than if you go back? It will be more detail. So it you'll will. be able to see. So the resolution here is very high level. Uh -huh. And you'll get a more granular, granular uh, display of the data. So these are essentially summarizations of the data. And you will get okay. a complete view with, that's less smooth. Yeah, so it won't have a rolling average applied to it or anything. It'll be raw values and okay. the, the where the inside occurs will be pointed out and things like that. I see. So go back to view insight. That makes sense. Go back to view insight details. Sorry, I'm asking so many questions. Oh, no worries. Oh, really why we do these calls? Yeah. Um, so why? Um, so over on the right hand side, it's the view insights from other repos, and I, that makes a ton of sense to me because this is like categorized by Rails. If you scroll down, it's by Comcast and GraphQL and Netflix and all that kind of stuff. Right. And so if you scroll up, what's the rationale for those two immediately so, below? Yeah, so on the Insights page, they are ordered by uh, most significance of the insight. So the highest, there's like a scoring, ins, uh, a scoring system behind the insights based off of the amount the data point had deviated from the norm. So they're ranked 
by that significance. And so these charts that you're seeing right here that you're asking about mm -hmm. would be like the the most significant ones that you see most significant ones. at the top of the page up there. Yeah. Okay. So I would presume that whichever insight I click back on this page, those two mm -hmm. are probably going to show up. Yeah. Like they should be somewhere in there. Drift. They should show up on every page at that point. Yeah. If those are the top two most alarming or alarming insights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just their most significant deviations from a norm. Mm -hmm. You know, they could be really positive. They could be alarming. Mm -hmm. um, we don't assign a value judgment. Yeah. Yeah, I just meant like yeah, alarm. Exactly. Like it could be like a dinner bell alarm, or it could be yeah. like a fire oh, yeah, alarm. Yeah, yeah. Domino's pizza bell. It's, it's, alarm. A, it's, it's an alarm clock. It'll make you happier. Maybe it won't. <laughs> yeah. So I would recommend that instead of view other top insights for the header there, that you actually spell it out and say like the two panels below are the two most anomalous insights amongst all your repos across all your groups. Something yeah, like I completely that. agree. That <clears throat> no, I know it's a little wordy, but something like that. Yeah, <clears throat> we can we can make it with the fewer words. Yeah, mm -hmm. make the words good. <laughs> All right. Um, are there before we go on to the things that we wanted to show you? Are there any other questions that people want to ask? Uh, yeah. Where are you on the um, getting these insights pushed to Slack? We're designing the, the essentially the user interface part of it. You, and we're not talking about fancy user interface, but uh -huh. making sure that when we produce that, we're giving people insights that are current okay. and timely, and we're not overloading their Slack in their Slack Met channel with um, insights. Right. So we're okay. essentially tuning the notification mechanism mm -hmm. so that it doesn't become noise. Yes. Yeah. The, um, I can confirm that the mechanism mm -hmm. does work. I have been receiving multiple yeah. updates yeah. about okay. our repository. Um, so the connection's there. We're working on it. But like Sean said, we're just making it like so it's a good user experience and it's not overwhelming. Yeah. That you're just like, hey, something changed. Hey, so something changed. Yeah. No. Yeah. Something changed. All right. Exactly. So I'm, I'm anticipating, like I'd asked to see if we could have that done for this week. Um, and the team came back and said, we need more time just to tune that part of it out. Okay. And so we have a planning meeting every Wednesday night and I'll have a clearer picture of where that is in the, in the release cycle mm -hmm. very yeah. soon. So how, okay. um, if somebody wants to do that, how do they, is it a different install process? I mean, it's a different right now. It's a different repository, and we haven't opened it yet because mm -hmm. it's not working yet. Yeah, um, that's one of the other things that we that Jonah Jonah is the guy uh, who's who's uh, kind of in charge of the whole thing. That's one of the things he's trying to like document and like um, work on is like how do you install it? I think we're going to distribute it um, through the Slack like app store. Um, which would be pretty easy, but then they wouldn't have to do anything separate with Augur. It would just be like a install it and tell us like, you know, which which instance which, of yeah, Augur, which yeah, instance yeah. of Augur you want, and then um, you know have a couple notification like configuration preferences like do you want to add anybody, what channels? I don't know exactly all the details of that, but that's that's okay. the ideal the ideal way to do it. It'd be the least headache. Does it have to be a public instance of Augur? Good question. I do not know. No, because it relies on the front end. The API would have to be open, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't have to make the front end public. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you would have to have the API at a public URL because otherwise nobody could. Slack obviously couldn't find your repo unless it was available somewhere. Does Does Slack allow you to set up keys on an API? Like, would that be possible? Yeah, I think that's possible. I haven't talked to Jonah about it. Okay. Because I'm just thinking, I was thinking about this today. Um, I think it's a, a really cool idea. I think people would have a, a lot of interest in it. Um, so just the mechanisms of getting it done, that's all. Yeah, so like 
this is our channel on Slack for the OSS Health Notifier. Um, we can you can add it you can add it to a channel. I don't see anything. Oh, that's right. On account of I'm not sharing my whole screen. Also, go Let to share my whole screen. Go to notifier dash test. The channel. that's the channel I was. Uh, yeah. notifier. It's not an app. So click on go scroll up and click on channels. Notifier. That's where uh, I started. Eight, yeah. Uh, eight ninety one is the one. Uh, so go to jump to. Type in eight nine one. Okay. So Carter obviously knows. Uh, I'm trying to type eight nine one. Yeah, that one. Uh, okay. There you go. So this is the one that's that's working most recently. Okay. And so we've got. Um, that's even better than the one I was showing. Yeah, which is why I wanted you to get to it. <laughs> um, so. This is this is as what it looks like in its current form right now. Um, I think these are being pushed manually, um, and there's a couple different notifier test channels, um, if I remember correctly. But this is how it looks right now. Okay. Yeah, and, and you can, you know, basically, you can the settings and add the. What would happen if you click that link in theory? Which one? This one? Yeah. I, I guess that's just the GitHub. It's going to GitHub right now. Yeah. I think it might make, uh, yeah. Have this I guess if this is coming off an yeah. yeah, if yeah. it's coming off an API, then obviously there's no like screen to go to. Yeah, I mean the API. I mean, you, that's a good that's a good point to bring up in our user discussion. I'm sure that's one of the questions that the team has is if that were to go to Augur. I think that's a good yeah. idea. I think that was the original. Yeah. Did you write down the question about a? API key. Yes. Because I think obviously that's something we can do. I don't know if that's in our present roadmap or not. Yeah, and I can guess that some companies wouldn't want to have a publicly open <laughs> API yeah, endpoint. No yeah. doubt. No yeah. doubt. That might be something <coughs> that we would do. It would be easier to do when we had um, like authentication uh, implemented for the API, like login. Like you'd be able to you would have yeah. like an Augur API key, and then you would provide that API key to the Slack bot and um, whatever server, and it would only actually work if you provided the correct server and the correct API key. Just like as an example of how we might use it. Mm -hmm. um, logins, login and authentication is on the roadmap. It's not immediate, um, but that, that could be one way we do it. Or it might be at the actual Slack bot level. Like, are you authenticated to make Slack bot, Slack bot requests mm -hmm. to get those insights? Yep. Um, there's a couple different ways you can do it, but yeah, that's a good point, Matt. That's a really good idea. I was thinking about it today because Sean, I was thinking about design fiction. Yeah. <laughs> so, and this is that's this, cool. Well, it's a it's a famous text in sociotechnical design written by a gentleman named Herb Simon, mm -hmm. and he talks a lot about you know, some things we've done well that are, from a design perspective, are having this Slack notifier. Like this is a really good user interface design because it's not forcing people to go to a dashboard. Yeah. And the, having a standard data model is a good design because it helps people see transparently what is the data that's driving right. the whole system. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, it really, correct me if I'm misrepresenting Simon here, Matt, but it makes the what the data is transparent to a user which builds trust. Right. Yes. Yeah, and with this design fiction, it's trying to like, what is the most fictitious thing you can imagine in the world. <laughs> What's the future fiction yeah. in the world and how do you start designing towards that? Yeah. So and the, Slack, the Slack tool is sort of in that world for me. So. I think it is, yeah. yeah. Um, right. So other, other questions that people want to, or things you want to bring up? Nope. What is next, Carter? You're still uh, sharing your screen if you care, Sean. Sorry, what? You're still sharing your screen if you care. Yeah, I, I want to. Okay. I mean, it's probably, I think it's just easier to share. Is it, is this large enough with the whole screen share? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, because I could go back to just sharing a window and it would be. No, no, it's fine. Okay. So the Augur documentation has been updated a lot. Carter, I'll let you kind of just sort of work. Yeah. Just, just my, way to go, Apple. Yeah. Um, so uh, I've been working a lot on trying to <coughs> um, 
put a lot more in terms of documentation around the project. Um, one thing I do want to emphasize at this, almost all of this is the first draft of the documentation. Um, so I expect there to be plenty of bugs, plenty of things that don't make sense, plenty of typos. But it's not um, extensive. Yes, much, it basically was not there before and a lot of it is there now. So I'm gonna uh, post this link in the Zoom chat. Um, where's the? Oh yeah, you have to hit. Oh yeah, you're yeah. right. It's uh, <laughs> Zoom hiding itself from us. Where, there it is. Um, so this is the page that I'm looking at right now. And so uh, the one place that I have been trying to focus the most is this getting started guide. Um, and so the getting started is, um, it's, it's really targeted towards people who are not familiar with Augur at all. Um, so if you just, if you forgot how to install it or things like that, this page will still be useful to you. But um, the basic flow is, uh, first you want to give people a, a very over, a generic overview as a primer um, on the project and what we do. Um, and then there's a bunch of people. And then uh, the installation documentation. Um, so this, uh, we have updated it. I'd updated it uh, based on what we talked about last week, um, especially the, the thing that you mentioned, Georg, about um, installing a database, like mentioned, that's going to create the schema, um, you know, what you need to provide, and then like what's going to happen during it. Um, so hopefully that makes things a little bit more clear. Uh, and then also just more explicit about exactly what the back end dependencies, the front end dependencies. Um, most of this stuff um, has not changed. Uh, this, this part is still the same. Um, uh, some new things that I have been working on as well is we now have some documentation about the commands you can use to interact with Augur. Um, so, which is this page. So there's two kinds of commands. There's um, some back end utility commands um, provided by Augur, mostly for actually controlling the server or performing like various Python utilities um, or interacting with the database uh, if you don't want to use like uh, a tool, um, like, a, like a GUI tool. And then we have the make commands, which are used at a more project-wide level to do things like building the front end and the back end, doing installation, generating documentation, things that are not specific to the Python go in the make file and things that are specific to like the back end, the server, that Python stuff go in uh, so the library. The commands. Augur commands are effectively the user commands and the make commands are developer. Yeah, commands. yeah, There's pretty much. Develop, development and DevOps mm -hmm. um, are the people who would use make file commands and ordinary person might use the Augur command. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I won't go through all of them, um, but so the run command has uh, stayed the same. Um, we do have some new, um, did we talk about these commands last time? The add repos. Uh, we, yeah, I think we discussed them briefly, but it's important yeah. I think, to reinforce that we now let you add your repos and repo groups from very simple uh, CSV files. Yeah. Um, so we talked about these last week. There wasn't documentation for them, but ooh, there's yourself. Uh, <laughs> so these commands all require to put Augur in front of them, right? Yeah. Well, they're required for adding your repository. No, but if I run, if I just type db in my command line, what happens? Uh, no, it's auger. Yeah, it's auger. It's auger <laughs> space db space add repos. Uh, yes. So in the previous version of the documentation, I also did a lot of restructuring. It literally said the whole command here, and I think I accidentally deleted that part. So uh, to use whole command, so it, it, the whole command like for the add repos would be auger space db space add underscore repos and then a name to the CSV, uh, like it is right here. So this will be more explicit. It will be like right up here. Um, but like this is how you would use it. And then so there's more documentation about um, just exactly how to use them, the format. Um, but all these commands, uh, they're the same ones from last week. And then um, oh, I should also add uh, to kill. Um, so we do have a new uh, util command that's very useful. Um, util is mostly kind of miscellaneous stuff. It doesn't really fit anywhere else. Um, the one I use the most is one called Augur Util Shell. It's a developer can command. I won't cover it too much. Um, but there is a new useful one, which is called Augur Util Kill, which uh, if you have uh, instances of Augur or the workers running in the background, will automatically kill them for you. Um, before, you kind of had to do some weird, like, you had to go find the process IDs, you had to kill the process manually, or you had to just, like, if you couldn't find the process, you had to check what ports were open and what was happening on the ports. It was, it was a whole mess, not very easy to do, um, caused a lot of headache. So we just kind of all wrap that up in a simple auger util kill command. 
Um, I got tired of people asking the question, so I wrote it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that, <laughs> that that was brand new as of like what yesterday. Yesterday I did that. So yeah. I haven't had time to put it in here um, in the documentation, but I mean it's super simple. You just type Auger Util Kill and it works. Um, Can I say something? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so on, um, I think to Georg's point. So like you have run and then you have an example of what the run command would look like. Mm -hmm. But on DB, I guess you do have the example there. But the there's auger stuff commands and auger DB by itself doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And so I think I think just sort of making those commands visible at the top level under each heading. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I'm also thinking it probably would also be really useful to have like sample output. Like what should you see on your screen when Augur run is happening? Or what should you see on your screen while Augur DB add repos is happening? Would that also be something that you would want in here as well, Matt? Um, well, I'm kind of speaking on behalf of Georg here. I think it's just a, it's just a simple, like a, a flow issue. Yeah, I completely agree. Okay, Eric, I don't know what you were. Yeah, I was looking at this documentation and it leaves out some of the information I need for how to structure the commands. Mm -hmm. Because it just tells me there's a DB command and here's an example. Mm -hmm. But to have a good overview of how to structure the command. So for example, when you look at the git man pages. Right. They tell you all of the optional parameters, and then they say you can have a command. And then when you go down to the list of commands, they tell you all of the available commands and then explain each of those how to run them. Um, it just be, makes a little bit more explicit from, it has a little bit more structure to it. Sean, that's you. Is it? I don't even No, that's me. Sorry. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I don't even have that page of anything open. <laughs> but you know, sometimes Google, if I have Gmail open, Google will just decide that it wants me to take calls. Um, sorry, I mean, this, looks, this looks great. So don't take any of these comments as. Oh, we, no, absolutely. Uh, like, those comments make it greater. Yeah, so. like, I've been super, like, in, like, in the weeds on this. Um, and, like, I know all of the commands, so I know how to use them. So, like, Having you guys like look through it and tell me what doesn't make sense is like that's exactly what I need. I really mm -hmm. appreciate the feedback. Like that, it's going to make it so much better. Just like having a new frame of mind about that kind of stuff. I like Sean's idea of just kind of moving the command to the top. The mm -hmm. example, like right under the. So like button. under under DB, just list all of the available subcommands and right. how to run them and what their form looks like. Right. That's like a, it's like a man page. Mm -hmm. Because as of now, it kind of looks like DB is on the same level as add repos. Yeah, it does. I'm sure yeah, there's a sub, I'm sure there's a subheading. Yeah, implied, but yeah. it's not clear. There is like if you click on DB, yeah. it's with the sizing and yeah. just the color of the. I've been the way that I've been having to fight RST restructure text to to mm -hmm. get this to to look weird to look right and to not be. I like restructured text a lot, but there's also a lot of gripes I have about it. Um, but yeah, there's there's also probably like an easier way to say like this is the DB like grouping of commands or like the mm -hmm. collection or family like and I the idea that this isn't a command it's just like a family of commands um, that that probably would also help. But yeah, there's there's definitely some, so some like organization. If, if you go back well. to the start of the library commands, it's at the very top of the library. Yeah. Commands. So okay, so you do say there's there's it's not really categories. It's there's three there's three there's three sets of commands. Yeah. Augur run. Augur run's the only one of those that stands on its own. Mm -hmm. So it's different. Mm -hmm. Augur DB and Augur util require a subcommand. Yeah. So if there's a way to make that clear that Augur run is just Augur run. Mm -hmm. But Augur DB has these subcommands and Augur util has these subcommands and maybe even just listing them out mm -hmm. at the very top of this page with their hyper hy hy hyperlinks. Yes. Um, can speak. Um, I think it would be really helpful. Yeah, I agree. It might even be, and the more I think about it, like the fact that the DB command is so much longer, like that section is so much longer than util, um, at least right now, it might even be worth it to just have these be three separate pages. Like this is the page for each category to break it down yeah. even further. Although I don't want to 
I, I do have a bad habit of organizing things too much sometimes. Like I'll put everything in its own folder to be as specific as possible. And I, but I started to do that, so I just like trying to avoid it. Um, I, I'll mess around with it and, and, and see what works and then get, get y'all's feedback on the next call. Um, um, that's good. One, I just thought of one other thing that yeah. actually wasn't done last week. We, we now have our value worker deployed and functional. <laughs> And the value worker will go through all of your clone facade repositories and tell you how many lines of each programming language are in that repository and what the complexity, the code complexity of every file in the repository is, which enables, and it's using the Kokomo algorithm, which enables you to estimate the cost to rebuild as well as the uh, labor investment inside of each repository. Mm -hmm. Obviously, at some point we'll add parameters, but there's a standard Kokomo um, value that's stored right now. Mm -hmm. Where what, is that not in the master branch? Sorry, I said again. Is it not in master? Where is that? It is in master now. Oh, okay. We, yeah. Yep. It's uh, everything. We we just pushed a release earlier this morning, and it's in it is in master now. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it, um, we are, the next step on that is to build the API endpoint. So right now it's just data. Mm -hmm. uh, during your inaugural instance, just having that repo labor data could be a, a high value item for you. Mm -hmm. And then I'll, I'll just mention that the next thing that's coming is a tighter integration with Augur SBOM. Matt Snell and I talked through the details and I think, I think for Ubuntu deployments, we're definitely by next week gonna have it so that you can deploy all of the risk stuff um, on an Augur instance using a, a standard set of install commands mm -hmm. in Augur. I think for for other operating systems other than Ubuntu, it's going to be more difficult and I can't predict how long it's going to take. And that's because all of the scanners that are in Physology are built only for Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. So they've made the choice to only support Ubuntu in, in Physology. And so we have to, we'll probably for that stuff are gonna be stuck with just Ubuntu and I think we can make Fedora work pretty easily. I, yeah, I think it's Winter and Yeah, I don't. Maybe? No, they state they only support. Oh, you. I saw something about Debian yeah. on the wiki this morning, but yeah, maybe maybe they do support Debian, but they focus yeah, definitely on Ubuntu. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the Debian translation is pretty easy. The Mac translation is complex. I've I've got it pretty I'm pretty close. I'm like I've got, I went through like eight different little things yesterday, and I've almost I'm like I think I'm towards the end of the compile issue, but. It's mm -hmm. not done yet, and you, we can't really tell on that will take. Yeah. Um, so, uh, moving through the rest of the documentation, I'll try to keep it quick. Um, there's some more like make file documentation. Um, this, all of this stuff, actually, uh, you'll pretty much see this exact stuff if you just type make in the root directory of Augur, um, which is pretty standard for any yeah. system building. Yeah, um, it's just like a couple of them have a little bit more definitive <laughs> examples, um, like of how to use like the parameters. Um, for the most part, it's all the same. It, it probably would be easier. Most people are just going to type make to see what's available. I just wanted to put it on here so that we can have it um, in case people like forgot or if it's like they just want to look at it on the web, they can look at it on the web. Um, but you know, these are mostly for developers. Um, especially like the making documentation, making the tests, um, or the running tests, like rebuilding stuff. Um, mostly for us, but I thought it would be nice to put it on here as well. Um, and then, why is there a, why is there a, what's the make install for? That's actually how you install Augur. Does but I'm work? down in usage. And I... Oh, if you just, I'm, if you scroll up, I'm currently in, keep going. I'm in docs, getting started usage. Just that top. Oh, here? No. I think uh, he's talking about the bread that comes yeah, at the see. top. Yeah, where you are right there. Right. So why why are you telling me to install? He's saying like, why is the installation instruction under usage? Oh. It's it's not okay. So that's maybe that's just for this. Just says what the command does. It's not telling you to do it. Like, I okay, yeah. So I, I know. I see. I see. Should be the word command. Yes, it should be. Uh, 
because I don't know what the hell you use it. Make install will install the project, not saying literally run make install. Is that like the language confusion? I think it's the word usage. Yeah, yeah it's just there's a section called what is Augur? There's a section called installation, which is where I would expect the make install to be. Yeah. And then I'm in usage, which I assume I've done the install. This is really like a how do you command, command library. It's like yeah. a command, it's like a command. Um, like how do you use it? Augur, Augur commands. Yeah. Or maybe even command line. Because these are all command line. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So maybe, maybe commands is better and I'll just. You know, Com maybe command reference. Yeah. Yeah. But my thinking here is like, Install it. Now you've got it installed. How do you use it? I didn't really know what to put for. I just put usage. Um, command reference. Command reference. I like that. Or command library. Or just the word commands. And then just have library commands, make all commands. Because um, you're right. Make install is in installation. So we've, we've set apart installation, obviously, to make to give people a one-stop shop for mm -hmm. installing Otter. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you should also, like, why do I... Um, like make, make install and make clean. Like those are just kind of normal things. Mm -hmm. So why are they here? These are all the make file commands. I took all the ones that we had and I just was like, I'm going to put them on here and write a short blurb about it. So that you have idea, an idea of, you can come here and look at all of the available make commands. But what, why is this? This seems like there's a declaration here that this, that make is unique to Augur. I mean, makes um, not. No, that's that's definitely not the intention. Okay. Um, I mean, these are just the commands. These are our make commands. So, like, make install, make clean. Those are common. Um, I think make rebuild and make dev. Those those aren't found in every make file. No. Install and clean are extremely common. Like almost like your bare minimum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But some of the others are specific to what Augur does. Okay. Okay. I mean, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So scroll down then. Scroll down. Yeah. So that's, how far. that's it. Keep going. <clears throat> so you have six, six, seven, <laughs> keep going. Eight, nine, 10. So I don't know, like a dozen make commands. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and there used to be a lot more, and there's some of them that probably don't. Like, at some point, I want to just have... The, the only reason I put these here, like, really, every time you should be screwing make docs. Um, but I wanted to put these here just, like, just in case you only made a change to the Sphinx docs, which is what this is, or to the API docs. Um, I put those in there. So it might be a little bit confusing to have these both in here. Um, okay. Mostly this is for, like, new developers, like... I can just point them to this page and go, here's all the stuff. <coughs> um, you know, I, I, I want, you know, the more choices you give somebody, um, the more confused they're likely to get. Um, so I want to keep it as low as we can. Um, we're working on it. I do. Okay. No, that makes more sense when you talk through it. Mm -hmm. Bring back a uh, make back in. Or do they have it? I think it's in there, but I. Yeah. It, it so actually, like, that command does exist, but I didn't document it because I didn't know if it was going to exist by the time I was done with the make file. So like if we're on, we're on a right now, like, okay. if we just type make, it actually lists all of the available commands. Yeah. Um, and then I didn't list the specific dev commands in the make file and that, that one because they're so granular. Um, it might be worth it to do it or just to only only have only like document make dev anywhere and not have start stop and restart. Um, so how is this list that Sean just pulled up different from the list you have? This list is a subset of the yeah line list. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> um, and the ones I didn't document were ones that I was unsure would continue to exist. Um, so I like, have a lot of make commands that have been there since the dawn of Augur. Yeah. Okay. Have it worked like it. In we have years. we may phase them. We phased out a bunch already. Yeah, but there are others that we may also phase out yeah. because they don't serve a useful purpose. Yeah, anymore as as the software's advanced, the need for these other commands has diminished mm -hmm. because it's simpler. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and 
all of the ones in there should work. Like we've gotten rid of the ones that don't. Um, but you know, it's. I also recognize that having the actual like having make commands and auger commands, like having two ways to interact with auger, um, provides it provides normal. This normal. It is normal. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure that you know Making, it's clear yeah. what goes in what and what command you should use to do which thing. It's you know, make is like, make is pretty much well right. Well recognized as the way that you build the software and compile mm. things, mm. and that's what we're using it for for the most part. Yeah, um, make dev is just a command that'll run your local Augur instance so that you can do development, and that's I think that's another fairly common command. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, any more stuff about the make file before I uh, blow through some of the other stuff really quick? I think uh, what is all, what else is on our agenda? Uh, we talked about Augur util kill. Um, Oh, we do need to ask about this. And there was one kind of uh, quality of life updates. Should we talk about this really quick? Did we do the Did we talk about that? Yeah. We talked about this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, one, so one question we have on the install, and this sort of settles a debate that Carter and I are not a debate, but we're trying to decide. So when we do the install script now, we ask people what directory they want the facade repositories to be cloned into. And there's, there's two possible behaviors. One is they could give us a directory that does not exist yet underneath some root, typically their home directory, or they could give us a directory that already exists. In, a, in one case, uh, walking someone through an install, they didn't think, they, they assumed that the directory would be created for them, and it wasn't. So the question is, is it better to create a directory for a user, or is it better to expect them to have it there already. Mm -hmm. And if we create it for them, should we like the double check that they want to create it first, like in case they put in a typo? Like mm -hmm. what's what would what would like you guys expect to have? And this is a very granular install question, but that's yeah. the level that we're at right now in yeah. terms of making the install very friendly. Yeah. I would like to be prompted to ask if I would like to create a directory. Okay. So perhaps, would you like to create a facade directory, or would you like to use an existing directory, something like that? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Like, create it's a new just, one. It's just C or N are my choices: create or new, or, or right. create or existing, one or use existing one. Yeah. Yeah. So would that would that be better than provide? You just say provide a like provide a path that might or might not exist, and if it doesn't exist, then we ask you to create it, or would you rather have just straight up, like, you know, the first question be- If I say use an existing one, then it better exist. Okay. That yeah. would be my expectation. Okay. Right. All right. Yeah, okay. If I say create a new one, then just give me the, just say like, okay, I'm going to create a directory located here. Yeah. Yeah. And then I just say yes or no. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we'll, we'll put in some retry logic. If for whatever reason that directory already exists, we'll just keep asking you for a new one. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that's pretty, that's, that would be standard. That would okay. be expected behavior. Okay, yeah. yeah, that helps answer that question. Um, so who, who, uh, who, who <laughs> I want to know who won. Um, um, no. That's actually, that's actually uh, not what either of us were talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we both had different opinions. I was like, just make the directory for them. Don't ask them. Yeah, um, and I was like, we should ask them everything that they would ever want to know about it. <laughs> and then you were like, nah. If I so had to pick one like, or another, I would say make the directory. Because yeah. most people aren't going to have it, would be my guess. And they're just yeah. kind of, my guess is they're just kind of cruising through the install process. Mm -hmm. Right. And they just want to like click a bunch of yeses. Yeah. Exactly. So. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I guess there's nothing left in unless the uh, person left. Yeah. I mean, um, I feel, yeah, it's like, or, I guess we could walk through the documentation a little bit more, but um, I want to see if anyone has any additional questions because reading, like, scanning all the documentation feels a little bit like reading the slides. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. I, I, I do want to go ahead, Matt. I have a request. Could somebody in the chat put the link to the auger? API documentation. Yeah, I actually did send that yesterday. Oops. Is it in the notes? No, I put it in the chat. That was my, that was my failing. Okay. 
I don't know why that's happening. Uh oh. I got this yesterday periodically today. I don't know. Is it the trailing slash? I don't think it is. I don't think so. No. Okay. Um, that happened to me for a little bit yesterday, and I don't know. Okay, I'll have to go. Um, well, just send me that link anyway. Oh, Other you know what? I know what happened. I did the install, and I think our documentation built. I'll send you this link. Just because yeah. I assume the link doesn't change. No, the link no, doesn't change. I rebuilt this version of Augur right beforehand. And just I put it in the chat. I'll get it out. Of it. I didn't know you were putting it in the chat last time. Yeah. Okay. Can you save that link that Gayard put, Sean, in the chat? Yeah, you're welcome. I have another question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I saw the section usage, um, my mind immediately went to, okay, I'm done installing. I opened the browser. How do I use the interface? Is that mm -hmm. An intention to you for you to create a documentation of the user interface. That is an excellent question that I do not have an answer for. That's I honestly haven't. I've never even thought about doing that. What is? It? I'm not sure I understand. This um, so Gerard, you said that when he saw the word usage in the documentation, his first thought. And correct me if I'm wrong, Gerard. Was okay. I've done installing. I'm going to open the browser. How do I use the web interface? Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah that's, I asked, yeah, I never even thought about that connotation. Yeah, there are a lot of questions about how to use. Yeah, yeah. Um, good idea. And I guess up until now, it's been rather fascinating, but we have staples yeah. now that we yeah. Yeah. should document. It's right. a good point, Your Thank you. Yeah, uh, and I think you could add on to that, like, how do I use the API endpoint? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so maybe change this current. Usage section to a yeah. command reference and then have another usage section. Which that's is what, yeah, they brought up. Um, API usage. Yeah, yeah, I definitely, both of those ideas I really like. Um, hey, and I, would, I, would put, I would put the usage thing that Georg is talking about after installation. Mm -hmm. so what is Augur? Installation usage. Right. And things like Command reference. <laughs> That's... Yeah, I can go down here and like library documentation. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so really quickly, uh, I I won't go through it all, but um, the other the other things I we've been working on a lot as far as like places that would be really good for like feedback needed. Um, I completely overhauled the create a metric section. Um, the visualization part isn't there yet. We are working on that, but the overview, the creating a function, and the creating an endpoint. Um, and then we're also working on the architecture stuff, the data model, the actual like back, this should probably just say back end architecture, and then the data model. Um, and then as well as the data collection stuff, like starting the data collection workers, the config file. Um, there is some, a lot of it is still under construction, um, but those are some stuff on the first page. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, the creating a metric, um, the architecture and the data collection um, are like the three main ones that, well, really everything in getting started, the architecture and the data collection are the ones that have been, have had the most changes made to them. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to, yeah, like the development guide and the library documentation haven't really changed a whole lot. Development guide doesn't even really exist right now. It's, it's not ready to exist, we're still working on it. Um, I think yeah, I, I think I'm, blinded by that picture. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. but I was trying to provide an illustration of the housekeeper, broker, and worker that didn't follow stereotypes. Like something <laughs> I'd see in a student PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and those great. arrows are fabulous. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I really like it. And it looks great. <laughs> um, <laughs> the architecture <laughs> documentation explains the technical details. This is written more for a, yeah. a person who wants to understand how, what's all this crap, and yeah. I just want to start collecting data. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, especially the data model part of this is what's changed the most. Um, I don't think that this version of creating the schema is correct. Uh, maybe. Uh, I don't think so. I'll fix it. Well, 
close. It's close. Um, and it used to not exist. Well, we have all. We actually, it's all scripted now. So yeah, we almost don't even need this. Yeah, um, this all happens based on your choice of an installation script. Where mm -hmm. previously people had to run this themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, as far as documentation stuff goes, it's a lot. We don't want to read from the slides or just like go through it bit by bit. Because also we have four minutes, and that would take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Um. I just wanted to point out the sections that have had the most change. Um, and, you know, I've got a, a, all of that feedback about the command and use and stuff is really appreciated. I'm definitely going to go and make sure all of these look way better. And hopefully by the next call, I'll have a much, a much better and more coherent and understanding version of that, of that usage section. Um, other than that, I know we're right at I'm almost right at time. I think that was everything that we Let's, wanted to yeah, talk about. Just open it up to any other questions that individuals on the call might have. I'm good. Hearing none, uh, motion to adjourn. Thank right. you. Motion, second. Thanks, guys. Okay. I can. Thanks, everybody. See you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.